our leadoff question is from the uh, Honorable Ed Meese, the former Attorney General of the United States who's representing the Heritage Foundation. At least 42 terrorist attacks aimed at the United States have been thwarted since 9-11. Tools like the Patriot Act have been instrumental in finding and stopping terrorists. Shouldn't we have a long-range extension of the investigative powers contained in that act so that our law enforcement officers can have the tools that they need? Now, as listeners to last week's uh, episode of this podcast will remember, we were talking about the mysterious death of Danny Casalero, the investigative journalist who was breaking the story of what he called the political scandal of the century, the octopus, which was a political conspiracy that went into the very top echelons of the United States government and revolved around the case of Inslaw Inc., a company that developed some software, prosecutor management information uh, software that was used by the Department of Justice under contract and then stolen by the DOJ for their own purposes. And that was the story that Casalero was investigating, and he started to uncover a web of deceit that went all the way, as I say, into the very top echelons of the United States government, and he ended up dying under mysterious circumstances in August of 1991, and all of the notes and all of the the drafts for the book that he had been working on the case were missing after his alleged suicide. So that was the thread that we were looking at last week. And as I say, this is the second part of that story. So if you have not listened to episode 209 of this podcast yet, I highly recommend that you do so because all of the information from that episode will be highly, uh, highly important for understanding the content of this episode. Now, I should explain the clip that you just listened to was a clip from the beginning of this week's Republican nominee presidential debate on CNN, which started with a question from Edwin Meese, who was identified on screen as coming from the Heritage Foundation, of course, a a right-wing think tank. And of course, that is who he is affiliated with these days. But of course, he would probably be more uh, famous for being the 75th U.S. Attorney General. Yes, during the Reagan administration, he was the uh, uh, the head of the Department of Justice. And in fact, the head of the Department of Justice, just as the Inslaw Inc. case, the scandal of the Inslaw Inc. case and the Promise software was erupting. So that's information that will come in handy uh, later in this episode. And as we start to investigate some of the characters involved in this octopus, interesting to see that he's there opening, literally opening this uh, pre- Republican presidential nominee uh, debate with a something that we all know, I think everyone who listens to this podcast knows to be complete bull excrement, saying that the Patriot Act has foiled 42 terrorist plots, which we all know means that the FBI basically set up a bunch of um, morons and imbeciles who could barely tie their own shoelaces to go and commit these terror attacks around the world, literally funding them and training them and providing them with all of the, the materials that they needed and literally paying their living expenses and probably tying their shoelaces for them in the morning as well, and case after case after case being dropped there are far far too many examples of that to go into right now but of course that's the uh, that's the part that he left out conveniently from that very leading question but at any rate interesting to see Edwin Meese popping up in the Republican presidential nominees uh, d- debates this week and I thought that was well r- rather apropos of the entire topic that we're talking about but as I say, this entire case revolves around the, the case of the Promise software being stolen from Inslaw Inc. by the Department of Justice. And in order for you to get a better handle on the on the proceedings, the way that those uh, the, the rulings and counter rulings and appeals and all of that played out over the over a period of several years, I will include in the documentation for today's episode some links to some Washington Post editorials that span the years 1987 to 1993, talking about these uh, the Inslaw case and uh, basically pointing out all of the twists and turns. And it's it's interesting to note that the very first one of those uh, editorials in that collection that I'll include in the documentation section from 1987 is talking about the, the ruling that was handed down by U.S. bankruptcy judge George Basin in the case in 1987, in which he literally ruled, ruled that the Department of Justice, quote, took, converted, and stole, quote, by trickery, fraud, and deceit, the Promise software. Um, you can't get much more blatant than that. So, of course, in that ruling, uh, there was a, a high, hefty uh, 
payment for damages that was awarded to Inslaw that was supposed to come from the Department of Justice. Of course, it was appealed and on appeal and in the entire process, uh, the, the Department of Justice so far has avoided having to pay that compensation. And amazingly enough, it's all still going on to this day with Inslaw still trying to get some sort of reparation for what the judge in that case, again, ruled was literally stole a case of stolen property. The Department of Justice, the Department of Justice literally stole the property right from them. And so I will direct your attention to those Washington Post editorials, which I think do a good job of highlighting some of the twists and turns in that case. But as we left off at the end of last week's episode, we were looking into the strange death of Fred Alvarez, who was gunned down with two of his friends at the Cabazon Indian Reservation in Indio, California. And somehow this is related to the octopus that Casalero was investigating, because as we noted, one of the only things that survives from Casalero's notes was a folded note that was found in his shoe at the time of his death, folded up in his shoe, that indicated that his the, one of the final chapters that he was working on for his forthcoming book on the octopus somehow tied into the Alvarez connection and what was happening on the Cabazon Indian Reservation. And as we've just seen, of course, Alvarez was killed it, killed in cold blood in a cold case that was never solved. And that was where we left it. But of course, it's now coming to light who was involved in that and the players that were involved in that. So it's an extremely interesting part of this bigger puzzle. So in order to understand what it, the Cabazon Indian Reservation was doing and what, how it was involved in all of this, let's turn to another report from KESQ that talks about why Fred Alvarez was murdered. Tonight, News Channel 3 investigates. We have new information on the cold case investigation of a 1981 Rancho Mirage triple murder. News Channel 3 has learned three local Indian tribes are part of the investigation into these murders. News Channel 3's Nathan Baca joins us tonight with a look at what these three tribes are suspected of doing. Nathan. Tamara and John, the three tribes under investigation are the Cabazons, the Santa Rosa, and the Torres Martinez. They are suspected of setting up secret experimental weapons testing deals in the 1980s. Three people who knew too much were murdered execution style in 1981. Riverside County cold case detectives believe the documents you are about to see are what they died for. New documents reveal how local Indian tribes were involved in bringing large caliber weapons testing to the Coachella Valley. Riverside County Sheriff's Department cold case detectives are looking into whether a former Cabazon Indian vice chairman was murdered in 1981 with two other people in this home to keep these weapons deals secret. An experimental electromagnetic weapon called a railgun was on the testing list. Documents show a 1980s business partnership between the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians and security contractor Wackenhut to form Cabazon Arms. This is Santa Rosa Mountain, near Highway 74, where the secret weapons testing was meant to take place. Newly uncovered documents show the Santa Rosa Band of Indians was working with the Cabazon Indians. They plan to build the experimental weapons in the mountains south of Pinion Pines. To find out more about rail guns, we talked to UC Riverside physics professor Dr. Harry Tom. A rail gun is a electric operated gun. Uh, it uses only uh, a battery and you send electricity through the projectile itself and uh, you make it Propel. This recent video from U.S. Navy weapons testing shows how gunpowder isn't needed to hurl a giant bullet at supersonic speeds. It is the future of artillery, but it's so hard to perfect, it's been tested for 30 years. We asked the Santa Rosa Band of Indians that pursuing weapons testing requiring enormous amounts of electricity and environmental dangers fits in with its promise to protect the natural resources of sovereign tribal land. The tribe has not responded. Additional documents show the Torres Martinez tribe granted Cabazon Arms Company the right to test large-scale weapons on 30,000 acres near the Salton Sea. Torres Martinez tribal leadership have also not responded to our questions. Considering the Indian tribes have moved on with their large casinos, experimental weapons testing deals 28 years ago may not seem to matter anymore. But three people were murdered 28 years ago in Rancho Mirage. They left behind family members that search for their killers to this day. Many of the small-scale weapons testing were later used for the Nicaraguan Contra guerrillas that became the focus of the Iran-Contra scandal in the 1980s. Wagonhut Corporation withdrew from doing business locally for a while, but it is back, now winning the contract for jail security in Desert Hot Springs. 
approval of professional services agreement with Mackinac for jail security services for the police department. This is quite frankly right up uh, Wackenhut's so, you know, alley. Very Those in well favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. The crimes of decades past are being investigated once again by local detectives, looking into whether three people died to bury the secrets now finally coming to light. So, we have the murder of Alvarez and his friends being part of an attempt to silence the blowing of the whistle about this attempt to develop secretive weapons on the Cabazon Tribal Reserve in Indio, California, with a deal with a defense contractor who is Wackenhut, who is going to develop some sort of secret advanced weaponry. What a bizarre story, and made all the more bizarre when you start to look into who Wackenhut is and what interests it really represents. And in order to do that, I will highly recommend an article from Spy Magazine from September 1992 that looked into Wackenhut and what it really is, and... The uh, Spy Magazine article is, is sub-headlined, By 1966, Wackenhut could confidently state that it had secret files on 4 million Americans. And we'll read from a section of that article entitled, Wackenhut has been involved with the CIA, ex-analyst says, on a quid pro quo. Quote, We met George Wackenhut in his swanky, muy macho offices in Coral G Gables. The rooms are panelled in a dark, rich rosewood accented with grey-blue stone. The main office is dominated by Wackenhut's 12-foot-long desk and a pair of chairs shaped like elephants, Republican chairs, he calls them, complete with real tusks, which, the old man says with some amusement, tend to stick his visitors. The highlight of the usual collection of pictures and awards is the Republican presidential exhibit, an autographed photo of Wackenhut shaking hands with George Bush, whom Wackenhut, according to a former associate, used to call that pinko, as well as framed photos of Presidents Reagan, Nixon, and Bush, each accompanied by a hand written note. The chairman looks every inch the comfortable Florida septuagenarian. The day we spoke, his clothing ranged across the color spectrum from baby blue to light baby blue, and he wore a lot of jewelry, a huge gold watch on a thick gold band, two massive gold rings. But Wackenhut was, at 72, quick and tough in his responses. Near the end of our two and a half hour interview, when asked if his company was an arm of the CIA, he snapped, no. Of course, this may just be a matter of semantics. We have spoken to numerous experts, including current and former CIA agents and analysts, current and former agents of the Drug Enforcement Administration, and current and former Wackenhut executives and employees, all of whom have said that in the mid-1970s, after the Senate Intelligence Committee's revelations of the CIA's covert and sometimes illegal overseas operations, the agency in Wackenhut grew very, very close. Those revelations had forced the CIA to do a house cleaning, and it became CIA policy that certain kinds of activities would no longer officially be performed. But that didn't always mean that the need or the desire to undertake such operations disappeared. And that's where Wackenhut came in. Our sources confirm that Wackenhut has had a long-standing relationship with the CIA, and that it has deepened over the last decade or so. Bruce Ber Berkmans, who was assigned to the CIA station in Mexico City, left the agency in January 1975, putatively, to become a Wackenhut International Operations Vice President. Berkmans, who left Wackenhut in 1981, told Spy that he had seen a formal proposal George Wackenhut submitted to the CIA to allow the agency to use Wackenhut offices throughout the world as fronts for CIA activities. End quote. Well, I'll let you continue reading that extremely fascinating story, and as a side note, I'll throw in a link to the uh, to my own report on CIA front companies from BoilingFrogsPost.com, which of course gets into the the whole concept of CIA using fronts as part of their well dirty dealings around the world. But uh, extremely interesting to note that this uh, Wacken Hut that's involved in this Cabazon Indian reservation deal is uh, also working with the hand in glove with the CIA. At any rate, so this story is starting to expand and expand and expand, and we already know that it touches on such things as the Iran-Contra uh, affair and the October surprise scandal with the uh, the hostages, the Iranian hostages, the American hostages in Iran in uh, 1980-81 being released 
Just as Reagan was being inaugurated, literally the same day, within minutes of his inauguration, the hostages who had been he- being held for over a year uh, were suddenly released. And uh, as we know now, that was part of a political deal that had been struck by Reagan's associates in order to make sure that Carter did not gain any of the uh, political uh, laud- uh, applause or laudations for for that accomplishment and that it all went to Reagan. So an extremely interesting part of that puzzle and just adding up to a bigger and bigger and bigger spider's web and it threatens to become so big that it's almost unwieldy at this point so in order to start parsing through some of this and see how it relates back to what we were talking about last week with Danny Casalero's investigation we're going to be listening to an interview of someone named Sherry Seymour Sherry Seymour can be found at arc-roundtable.com, and of course the link will be in today's documentation notes. And in 2010, she wrote a book about the entire Danny Casalero octopus promise affair uh, called The Last Circle that represents 18 years of investigative research into the topic. And I will put in the caveat that I have not yet read this book, although there are a few sample sample chapters available for reading right there on arcroundtable.com. So uh, again, I would suggest you go and check that out. And and I will uh, look into it further myself, of course. But let's listen to an interview that she gave uh, at Coast to Coast AM back in December of 2010, in which she was talking about this Casalero case and how it ties into this Wackenhut Cabazon Indian Tribal Reserve case and the murder of Fred Alvarez. Sherry Seymour, you did not know Danny Casalero. You did not know about the existence of something that he dubbed the octopus, but you were working on what turned out to be your own tentacle of sorts. Tell me how you got started on it, and then we'll look at the bigger picture of of who the octopus was. All right. Uh, I was a reporter in Mariposa, California. Uh, Mariposa is a community of about, at that time, about 1,500 people, 15,000 in the county. And it was located in the Sierra Nevada foothills at the base of Yosemite National Park. And um, this was in the mid-1980s. And I was um, essentially covering uh, court appearances, and, and, and I had the sheriff's department beat, and so on and so forth. And I learned about a drug trafficking problem in our community. And uh, it was very, very... uh, It was a huge drug trafficking problem all over Mariposa and adjacent counties all over Central California. And these planes, little planes were flying into the airports in all these uh, Central California uh, counties and bringing drugs in from Latin America. At that time, I think it was part of it was cocaine being grown in Peru. Uh, It was being processed in Colombia and being distributed out of Costa Rica. And... um, this went on for about 10 years, and finally some honest sheriff's deputies and some grand jurors got together, formed an organization called Decency in Government, and incorporated that, uh, that organization and filed um, a lawsuit against the Attorney General of California, against um, the FBI director, against the governor of California uh, uh, for um, dereliction of duty for allowing this drug trafficking to uh, go on in that area. And it's not also, just dereliction, right? You're, you oh, yeah. came to believe that it was there were active lawmen who were directly oh, involved definitely. in this there thing. Were, there were deputies that were deeply involved, absolutely. Uh, in fact, they were uh, working an Indian reservation in Mariposa, um, in which the Indians are practically slave labor, um, doing um, growing marijuana, and they were bringing in Mexican nationals to cook meth on this reservation. So it was, um, according to the information that I had from the Indians, they were being forced to do this by some sheriff's deputies. Um, So when this lawsuit was filed, there was a lot of media attention and so on and so forth. And um, I then traced it to an organization in Fresno called The Company which was comprised of about 300 military, former military personnel and law enforcement officers. And they were importing billions of dollars of narcotics from Latin America. And they owned ships and airplanes, and they were doing um, mercenary operations and gun running. This was published in the San Francisco Chronicle. 
This was in 82, 83. So I traced it that far. Ultimately, when this decency in government group had a meeting with their lawyer, Ben Wagner, um, he presented a 700-page report on corruption and drug trafficking in a, in a nearby county, Tulare County. And I got a hold of that report, and it had been written by a former FBI agent, former senior agent in charge of the FBI office in Los Angeles. And I contacted him and made an appointment to meet with him at his home in Manhattan Beach. And I, when I arrived at his home, this was on November the 30th of 1991, and I asked him, I said, why, if we can manage to win two world wars, and we could put a man on the moon, and we can, you know, do all of, we're so capable of doing so many things, why can't we stop truck and trailer loads of drugs coming into this country? What is going on here? And he handed me an armload of documents and um, material relating to Danny Castellaro's investigation. This was my, and this was, uh, Danny had died just three months earlier, in August of 91, and this was three months later in November. And I took those documents home, and I jumped onto his trail. I decided to pursue his investigation. And uh, the following morning, on uh, December the 1st of 1991, um, I received a call from one of this FBI sources who then proceeded to give me the names of all of the um, people in the company uh, in Fresno and their connections to Mariposa and all the adjacent counties. And he said, uh, he proceeded to talk about the Cabazon Indian Reservation and Wackenhut, the joint venture between the Cabazon Indians and the Wackenhut corporation on the Indian reservation to develop um, esoteric weapons, uh, also biological warfare, and so on and so forth. And that, and this man had been the same source that Danny Castellaro had. And I got a hold of Danny's phone bills for July 1991, the month before he died, and I called uh, the people that he had called and started talking to his sources. And I ultimately talked and met with Robert Booth Nichols at his home in Sher Sherman Oaks. So I spent several years after that uh, following that trail. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we paint uh, the big picture here okay. of the octopus? Because you're talking about the company as this group in, in California, mm -hmm. ex-lawmen, uh, intelligence guys who are running a drug operation. But that was just one tiny part of, of a much bigger picture, right? Yes. Um, in from what I learned over 18 years, in my opinion, the Department of Justice is the head of the octopus. And I believe that when Danny said to his friend, when he was heading out to Martinsburg, West Virginia, in August of 91, that he was heading out there to bring home the head of the octopus. And again, he was tracking a Department of Justice official and his connection to the Kali Cartel. I believe that he was right way back then that the Department of Justice uh, is the head of the octopus, and certainly was back in the 1980s. Well, it's not a sanctioned department kind of a thing. You're talking about people within the department, at least back then, right? Yes, yes. But it's, it's, it also involves Department of Justice, but other agencies, intelligence agencies, and folks all over. Yeah. These, um, as I said, the, 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 the crux of my story is the fact that the head of the Organized Crime Task Force and the FBI were wiretapping MCA executives who were connected to the, call, uh, to the uh, uh, Gambino crime family. And when they were shut down by the Department of Justice, they, unknown to the DOJ, all three of these honorable investigators secretly and individually provided the wiretaps to an investigator for the House Judiciary Committee. And they were stored in the National Archives. Um, so, they ex so they existed, and ultimately I was able to get copies of those. Um, now, one interesting aspect, the Department of Justice did an investigation of the Inslaw allegations, that their software, uh, Promise software, was stolen. But they also did an investigation of the death of Danny Kesslaro. And um, in September of 94... 
the Department of Justice released a 187-page report on Inslaw's allegations, 62 pages of which were exclusively devoted to the death of Danny Caslaro. Now we're going to take the tentacle into uh, Indio, California. I'm going to tell you that story. Okay. Okay. During forensic testing, um, the West Virginia State Police Crime Laboratory found a folded piece of paper inside Danny Castellaro's left shoe. And the shoe had been found in room 517 where he died, next to the bed. And the writing was confirmed to be Danny Castellaro's. And I want to stress that his documents and briefcase were missing from that room. But the note hidden in his shoe contained an outline for a chapter of his book, which he titled Behold a Pale Horse. And in the note, he discussed, amongst other things, the Cabazon Indian Reservation and Fred Alvarez. Now, um, the note clearly indicated that Danny was interested in the Cabazon-related triple homicide that occurred in Rancho Mirage in June 29th of 81, in which Cabazon tribal leader Fred Alvarez and his friends Ralph Boger and Patty Castro were executed by a mafia hitman. Uh, Danny had been planning to travel to Indio to investigate this triple homicide. And um, this, uh, this execution, this triple execution, occurred because Fred Alvarez was planning to go on July the 1st, the following day, to a lawyer to uh, expose and document what was taking place out there at the Cabazon Indian Reservation. And I'd like to uh, stress here that what transpired in Indio, California, during the time of this Cabazon Whack and Hunt joint venture, subsequently became the subject of investigations by the U.S. Department of Justice, the House Judiciary Committee on Inslaw, U.S. Customs, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, FBI, and police agencies, and media worldwide. So this was a this was a, a very highly publicized and investigated uh, incident. Let's and, fill in some other blanks here as well. The Cabazon tribe is a very small tribe in Southern California, a very obscure tribe, a, 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 an obscure sort of reservation, but it became a gold mine when it decided to go into the casino business. And eventually what happened at the Cabazon Reservation became the model and allowed for the vast expansion, a multi-billion dollar industry today, of Indian gaming, right? Totally. You, you, just, you just said the whole thing right there. The seat money for the Cabazon Casino originally came from a mafia member of the Gambino crime family. And this is according to a San Francisco Chronicle article that wrote about that. Um, so, uh, and, and the Cabazon Casino was the first casino in California, as you pointed out. So, and, and Fred Alvarez was opposing this because it was being funded by the mafia. Um, Robert well, in, in addition, I should say, uh, and this is from reading your book, The Last Circle, as you point out, I mean, there's a lot of other stuff that was going on on, the, on this reservation because of the gaming uh, industry that took roots there. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court essentially declares that reservation and all Indian reservations to be independent nations, right? Where, yes. where yes. whatever goes on there, that's their business, it's not our business. They were sovereign nations, and this is why Wackenhut chose um, Cabazon Indian Reservation to develop weapons uh, there and um, to test and develop weapons. In fact, they were actually going to manufacture. There were many proposals put out. And Robert Booth Nichols, our man over here that was uh, talking to Danny Caslaro, that was uh, tied in with MCA Corporation, he was uh, in on those proposals at Cabazon to develop this weaponry. He was a, a machine gun importer-exporter, and um, he had the permits. And he um, obtained permits to demonstrate... Um, sniper rifles and night vision goggles to Contra leaders at the Lake Coila um, gun range in Indio. This was all sponsored by the uh, Cabazon Indian Reservation uh, Administrator and Wackenhut. And on September 10th, 90, 1981, which would have been June, June, July, August, about four months after the death of Fred Alvarez and his friends, um, there were two two 
um, Nicaraguan generals that came to that demonstration. One was Eden Pastora Gomez, known as Camp Commander Zero, and one was Jose Curdell, known as Commander Alpha. And they were there along with the security chief for Cabazon, which was Jimmy Hughes, which I'm going to go into that in a moment, which was sure. he, was, he was subsequently arrested for the execution of Fred Alvarez and his friends. And he was uh, moonlighting on the side as a mafia hitman at the same time. Okay, just just to recap, I, I just I don't mean to interrupt you, but just to keep the audience with us here because it's a lot to absorb. This yeah. Cabazon tribe uh, is the first to establish its own casino operations. It leads to a court decision that says Indian reservations are indeed sovereign nations. It means that people like uh, Booth can go there and experiment with weaponry and basically be outside the scrutiny of people like the press or government agencies or lawmen. So suddenly you start seeing Danny Casalero sees all these connections that someone figures out, hey, Indian reservations are a great, great place to pursue all sorts of skullduggery. We can, we can be there with our mafia friends who are making money in the casinos. Uh, we can test weaponry. We, we can do all sorts of things. Yes. And Danny wrote several proposals, book and article proposals, about what was going on out there at the reservation. This was very much a part of his investigation. Um, the Fred Alvarez triple homicide cold case file was reactivated in late 2007. And this uh, story comprises the last chapter of my book, Chapter 25. Um, when Rachel Bagley, who was the daughter of one of the victims that was ecu executed, his name was Ralph Boger, and he was Alvarez's friend. And she convinced the Riverside Sheriff's Department to reopen the case. And uh, Detective John Powers of the Central Homicide Unit, Cold Case Division, was assigned to the case. And Rachel and John shared their findings, their investigative findings, with me for 15 months. Um, ultimately, on September the 26th of 2009, and this was 28 years after the murders, um, Jimmy Hughes was arrested as he boarded a plane destined for Honduras at the Miami-Dade International Airport. Now, as I mentioned, Hughes had been employed, employed as Chief of Security at the Cabazon Indian Reservation in 1981. And he, in 2009, he was being charged with three counts of murder and one count of conspiracy. Um, he had a military background, right? Yes, he did. He was a ranger. And he... he he had, after uh, the execution of Fred Alvarez and his friends, Jimmy had fled um, the United States, and he went to Guatemala, and then he went to Honduras, where he set up Jimmy Hughes Ministries. And he was sponsored by FGBMFI, which was Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International, to set up this ministry. And this is what he did. And when he he was actually coming in for a meeting, uh, FGBMFI meeting, uh, in the United States in Miami when he was picked up and arrested in 2009. And in going back into Jimmy's um, background, I found that Patrick Healy, a TV reporter for NBC News, had interviewed Jimmy back in 1985 before he left and went to Honduras. And in the news clip, which you can see on the Internet to this day, you can watch Jimmy speak back in 85, he said that the Alvarez homicide was, quote, an ordered assassination and that the hit was an authorized, backed government covert action. These are his own words on an NBC uh, news clip talking to a reporter in 1985. He ultimately uh, published his story. Uh, at an FGBMFI website, and it was titled A Hitman with a New Mission. And he, he, he talks quite extensively about his hitch in the min military, how he became a professional hitman for the mafia, and how he collected money and murdered several people, and even murdered, he would have a contract to murder one person, but he would murder everybody in the room. Did he say who, who authorized this one, the Cabazon, the triple murder at the Cabazon? He said it was the mafia. Well, that's um, not an official sanctioning, is it? I guess. Well, I guess well, if you work for the mafia, it's an official sanctioning. 
<laughs> That's what he says. Now, he, in Honduras and El Salvador, he gave lengthy interviews to newspapers uh, when he was living in Honduras, in which he talks about these murders. And he, again, stated in the, and I got copies of those uh, those newspaper articles and translated them into English. Rachel Begley actually dug that up for me. And, well, let's uh, hold let's hold that name for right. a moment. We still need to get into who comprised the octopus, who was at the top of this organization. Some of the names uh, would become very familiar to uh, most of the American public. We continue our conversation with Sherry Seymour, author of The Last Circle, right after this on Coast to Coast AM. Investigative journalist Sherry Seymour is my guest. She's written this book, The Last Circle, an excellent and fascinating account of uh, what led to the death of Danny Casolaro, his investigation of a group known as the Octopus. Sherry, tell me this. Um, I don't get the impression that the Octopus had monthly conventions or that they all got together for barbecues. Who were these people? How did it form and when did it form? Uh, I'll, we, let's go back to 1980s. Most of this all occurred starting with about 1981. Everything, I, I don't trace anything back any further than that as far as my investigation or Danny's. Uh, there was a book written by Dan Moldea. I believe it was published in 1986, and it was called Dark Victory. Yeah, well, I know Dan Moldea. He's a great reporter. He's the one that put me in touch with those uh with those, the FBI and the, um, the the lawyers, the prosecutors in Los Angeles, and got them to talk to me about the wiretaps. In any case, he wrote the book called Dark Victory, Ronald Reagan, MCA, and the Mob. And in that 1986 book, uh, MCA is called The Octopus in that particular book. I do not doubt for a minute that Danny Caslaro read that book. Uh, that may be where he obtained the name The Octopus. Uh, but again, the title, M Ronald Reagan, MCA and the Mob, pretty much tells you everything you need to know as far as The Octopus. Um, there were people within the Department of Justice at the time that this FBI... This, this is really a real scandal, in my opinion, the fact that the, that the mob was ordering the Department of Justice to shut down an FBI investigation, and this was captured on wiretaps. So uh, the fact that this was occurring, there were people within the Department of Justice under Edwin Meese who spoke with Marvin Rudnick, who was uh, a prosecutor in Los Angeles, who was investigating MCA and its mob connections, and he was told by a man named David Margolis, to shut down the investigation, and he didn't, and he was fired. A year later, Richard Stavin, who was another prosecutor who had been in charge of the FBI wiretaps, these were two separate investigations of mob infiltration of MCA by two different prosecutors. The FBI investigation wiretap, um, uh, the man who, who supervised that was Richard Stavin, a year later, he walked into Margolis's office, and he quit. And he said, and they both lost, these were prestigious prosecutors who gave up their careers because of this, because of the fact that this investigation was shut down. Um, so we have David Margolis back in the 80s, who uh, is, tell, is apparently involved in in passing the word to these prosecutors to shut down the investigation. I'd like to add that David Margolis today is the number two man under Eric Holder. Uh, let's see. He was the Deputy Assistant Attorney General from 1990 to 1993. He was the senior official organized crime section in the criminal division of the Department of Justice from 1976 to 1990. And as I said, much of what occurred in my book uh, started in 1981. So um, Margolis what? told the um, told a publication, the Legal Times, that he was the Department of Justice's cleaner. He said, quote, I clean up messes. And I believe that he was very correct about that. You mentioned Edwin Ed Meese. Was he? Do you think that he was part of the octopus, or he was just unaware Absolutely. of what was going? Oh yes. Okay. Uh, Inslaw had accused Edwin Meese and his crony Earl Bryan of 
stealing a, mo- a modified version of the Promise software. And he sued them based on the fact, he sued the Department of Justice based on the fact that he believed that uh, Edwin Meese was involved in the theft of his software. And two federal courts and the House Judiciary Committee on Inslaw concluded that the Department of Justice acted willfully and fraudulently, and that it took, converted, and stole Inslaw's enhanced promise software by trickery, fraud, and deceit. Now, we're going to jump back to the MCA investigation, which would have been overseen by Edwin Meese at that time. And um, we have other people involved at the Department of Justice. It was really under a lot of pressure at that time. Iran-Contra had erupted. Uh, Ultimately, they had a wholesale exodus from the Department of Justice. William Weld... uh, and four top aides resigned from the Department of Justice. They demand they wanted Edwin Meese to, to resign, and um, they went to Howard Baker's home at 7 a.m. Uh, in 1988, uh, and and said that if they didn't March 30th, if they didn't uh, fire Edwin Meese, they were going to resign. They were going to submit their resignations, and they did. Now we're going to connect Howard Baker here. Howard Baker was on the MCA. He was a former senator. He was on the MCA board of directors uh, when Reagan was elected president. Then Reagan appointed him chief of staff at the White House. And Howard Baker was present as chief of staff at the White House during this investigation of MCA Corporation. After the FBI wiretaps were shut down, Howard Baker resigned as chief of staff and went back to the board of directors of MCA Corporation. So you can see this was all like a circle. You know, you had all of these people from MCA connected to MCA, connected to Ronald Reagan, um, that were involved with the Promise software, and it all ties in very into a nice, neat little package. Again, that is an incredible amount of information to take in, so I would suggest not only that you re-listen to that particular excerpt from that conversation, but that, of course, you follow the link to go and listen to the entire conversation, and, of course, follow the link to go and research more into Sherry Seymour herself and read her book. But I think that at least gives us a bit of an overview of the octopus that Casalero was working on and the various characters involved in it and how its tentacles really did spread all over various mysteries of the 1980s and into many political intrigues. And I would love to be able to wrap this episode up with a nice pink bow and put it into some sort of conclusion that makes everything come together and make sense. But unfortunately, I'm actually going to do the opposite. I'm going to explode this outward and continue to increase the confusion and the amount of information contained in this web. Because unfortunately, what we've been looking at in terms of the octopus is only one side of it. The Inslaw case is just another side of it. The uh, The other side of it is also what happened to the Promise software itself, which which, of course, as we've alluded to, was, at least as claimed by Michael Riconosciuto, was reprogrammed by himself at the uh, behest of the CIA in order to become an enhanced version of the Promise software that would have a secret backdoor. And it was that enhanced version with the backdoor that was sold to various intelligence agencies around the world uh, via the DOJ through probably the CIA in order to propagate this software around the world and have backdoors into all of these various intelligence agencies. And from there, the story only gets even more amazing. So I'm going to put in some links to various sources on this story, which of course is just so broad and so vast that we can't really get into all of the aspects of it today. So I'm going to just have to exhort you to start doing your own research along this path to start to see where the P- the Promise software ended up. And I almost slipped and said P-Tech, because of course that was what we referenced in previous episodes of this podcast, that the Promise software eventually became what was uh, the P-Tech software that... Indira Singh was working on uh, cracking that case, and we've listened to uh, that 
episode 45, of course, in which we mentioned that, and that transcript of episode 45 has recently been made available on the articles tab of corporatereport.com, so I will once again direct your attention to that to follow that particular lead. But that's not the only way in which Promise has, well, at least been said to have accounted for a much, much greater technological scheme than what was previously held to be true. And in, as part of that, I'm going to throw in this audio clip from a video, the provenance of which I truly do not know. Where does this come from? Who is narrating? In what context? Where does the information in this clip come from? I'm not sure. And this is why I'm not putting this forward as the the honest uh, 100% truth. I don't know this information to be true, but it does present a lot of interesting linkages and things which I think can be, at least, we can start to verify whether this information is true and try to look for the sources behind it. And you'll notice when, for example, when I put out a podcast episode, I'll put sources to all of the uh, things that I uh, state in the episode. But when uh, when this kind of mystery video appears online, it often appears with no description and no documentation whatsoever. So, so who's to say exactly where this information is coming from? But at any rate, it does provide some interesting linkages, and it does represent, I think, the cut and the thrust of what a lot of people have been writing about Promise software for a long time. So I'll present you with this audio and take it for what it's worth, and uh, of course be wary and of all of the claims made therein, and please recognize when this story is becoming speculative and when it is talking about matters of fact that can be verified. But at any rate, let's listen to this talk about the CIA and the development of the Promise software. Promise software is a revolutionary computer program developed in the 1970s by a former NSA programmer and engineer, Bill Hamilton. In terms of computer programs, it represents the universal translator of Star Trek. PROMISE stands for Prosecutor's Management Information System. It's able to read and integrate any number of different computer programs or databases simultaneously, regardless of language or operating system. According to Bill Hamilton, the inventor, Edwin Meese, Reagan's Attorney General, along with Dr. Earl Bryan and others, stole the amazing software, modified it installing a trapdoor into that would allow those who knew of it to access the program and other computers, and then sold the software overseas to foreign intelligence agencies. Bill Hamilton knew his software had been stolen when requests for tech support came in from people he hadn't sold it to. The Israeli Mossad, under Rafi Eitan, again modified the software and sold it throughout the Middle East using British publishing magnate Robert Maxwell as a cutout. The revolutionary software allowed almost anyone with the trapdoor code to enter every database in every computer in every language at will simultaneously. This ability represents perfect information gathering technology that is undetectable, the ultimate prize of every intelligence agency in the world. The CIA through GE Aerospace in Herndon, Virginia, GAO contract number 82F624620. The FBI and the NSA modified the back door, but more importantly had enhanced the ultimate program with an artificial intelligence or AI. The program, which came to be called other names such as SMART, had originally been capable of automatically and secretly drawing any information from any computer and all computers connected to the Internet. The contractor that added the artificial intelligence component, GE Aerospace, was purchased by Martin Marietta, which l merged with Lockheed Martin, the largest defense and aerospace contractor in the world. Ed Meese was not the only one who recognized the potential promise in promise. Democrats had their own moves. Jackson Stevens is a presidential kingmaker, a lifelong supporter of George Bush, an Annapolis roommate of Jimmy Carter. The billionaire Stevens firm, Systematics, later Axicom, had mated the illegal software with banking software. In the late 70s and 80s, Systematics handled roughly 70% of all electronic banking systems in the U.S. Stevens teamed with Wortham Bank, Lippo Group, and BCCI, the Drug Intelligence Bank, 
to penetrate every banking system in the world. Promise software could be used to influence and predict financial markets worldwide. When Clinton was out of funds during his campaign, it was Jackson Stevens that loaned him three million to keep it going. Herbert Pug Winokur, CEO of DynCorp from 1989 to 1997, is a PhD mathematician from Harvard, where the mathematical breakthroughs using block modeling gave rise to artificial intelligence. In the 60s, Winokur did research for the DOD on the causes of inner city unrest in the wake of the 1967 Detroit riots. DynCorp was heavily involved in the evolution of Promise software. Winokur is a member of the board of the Harvard Endowment, which is not a benevolent university fund, but an aggressive predatory investor with 19 billion in assets invested in a hub subsidized housing high-tech defense operations, and George W. Bush's failing oil company, Harkin Energy. Harkin Energy. The Harvard Endowment saw its holdings skyrocket in the last decade, making 33% in 1999. That was the same year HUD announced a manual adjustment to reconcile a $59 billion accounting shortfall between its accounts and the U.S. Treasury account. Geomatics is a company at the heart of the Canadian Space Program and associated with Lockheed Martin. Geomatics uses remote sensing from space to locate natural resources such as oil, precious mineral, minerals, and other commodities. In the commodities market of the world, this kind of perfect information is the ultimate tool to predicting and controlling markets. Remote sensing can closely estimate the size of harvests of agricultural commodities such as coffee or oranges. Perfect information on the size of the orange harvest translates potentially to millions of dollars in the U.S. commodity markets alone. Exploration for oil and gas can be very expensive, but advances in imaging technology, GPS global positioning systems, and remote sensing technologies have advanced light years over the last few decades. This situation is custom made for enhanced promise software with backdoor technology. What better way to map and inventory the world's resources but by making each client pay, nation pay for it? Promise software makes it possible to compile a worldwide database on every marketable natural resource. Artificial intelligence enhanced promise based programs would be the perfect setup to make billions of dollars in profits by manipulating the futures trade in, for example, a rare metal like tungsten, or exploiting a sudden surge in the price of gold and platinum. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, were sold promise software to use in their intelligence gathering operations and began to suspect that their copies may have been altered and possibly all of their files were transparent and had been so for some time. The RCMP had been given their version of promise by the Canadian Security and Intelligence Services CSIS, which was created with the assistance and direction of the CIA. RCMP investigators stated that they and the CSIS had a rivalry similar to the one between the CIA and FBI and questioned whether any intelligence agency created by the CIA could be completely loyal to its native country. They further stated that they knew that the NSA had compromised their communications equipment. The Canadians put out a report that friendly nations were stealing sensitive technology, particularly related to aerospace, biotechnology, chemicals, communications, information technology, mining and metallurgy, nuclear energy, oil and gas, and the environment. The doctored versions of Promise software were acquired from both Robert Maxwell and Dr. Earl Bryan. Bryan is a medical doctor who founded Hadron and had been involved in shady dealings with firms connected with disease research, cytology, and biotechnology. 
Hadron is at the heart of the U.S. government operations involving biowarfare and vaccines. Ari Ben Menashe is Israel's top spy, who in reports was linked to Iran-Contra scandal and the October surprise that led to Ronald Reagan's election in 1980. Promise Software is described in his book, Prophets of War. The inventor of Promise Software hired Army CID investigator Bill McCoy to investigate the theft, but the famed investigator, who had broken many of the Army's biggest cases, was found dead of a heart attack. Within 48 hours of his death, McCoy's body was cremated and two days later all of his files, furniture, and personal belongings had been removed from his home. His home was then painted and sanitized. The Promise Saga leads to more than a dozen deaths, many of which share the same pattern. Within 48 hours of death, the body is cremated, residences are sanitized, and all records disappear. From Rupert Murdoch. Again, a fascinating story, and who knows to what extent all of that is the case, although I think we can all imagine that something like that has been at work for a very long time, and we can certainly understand how these types of systems, these backdoors, are implanted in various software in order to have that effect, and how we know that, for example, the uh, the U.S. government has backdoors into numerous software, and just as an example of that, I'll point you to a news story that came out just the other day on The Telegraph, although I get this from Cryptogon.com. Apple iTunes flaw allowed government spying for three years. And it says, quote, an unpatched security flaw in Apple's iTunes software allowed intelligence agencies and police to hack into users' computers for more than three years years, it's claimed. A British company called Gamma International marketed hacking software to governments that exploited the vulnerability via a bogus update to iTunes, Apple's media player, which is installed on more than 250 million machines worldwide. The hacking software, FinFisher, is used to spy on intelligence targets' computers. It is known to be used by British agencies, and earlier this year, records were discovered in abandoned offices of it that showed it had been offered to Egypt's feared secret police. Apple was informed about the relevant flaw in iTunes in 2008, according to Brian Krebs, a security writer, but did not patch the software until earlier this month, a delay of more than three years. End quote. So I invite you to look into that remarkable story and all of the things that are involved in a story like that not just the police services but apple itself which did not update its software for to account for the vulnerability for three years even though it was openly being used by the british uh, intelligence agencies to spy on their targets i mean just an incredible story and yet that is front page news on a mainstream news website so if that's the story that we're being told can you imagine how much more is going on behind the scenes The full picture of the octopus that is emerging from this study is so incredibly large, so incalculably complex, that it is so difficult for any one of us to put all of these pieces together or even comprehend the picture in its entirety. And you could spend decades going down this particular rabbit hole and still not necessarily finding bedrock, which is exactly why it is incumbent on all of us everyone who is listening to my voice right now, to be part of putting together this puzzle. No one of us is going to solve it on our own, and we certainly couldn't do it unless we were standing on the shoulders of giants like Danny Casalero, who paid for this information with their lives. That is an incredibly bright torch to be passing on to future generations, and one that it is incumbent on all of us to pick up and carry forward into the future. That's why I'm looking forward to hearing your own information, what you are able to dig up about this, and looking forward to seeing your posts on CorbettReport.com about this particular rabbit trail or octopus trail. And it is in this way that we will pay tribute to the life and work of those who came before, like Danny Casalero.